All right, everybody, welcome back to the best hour of their day. Fern here. I'm here with one of my favorites, Bobby Millsaps. Um, so I was thinking about this yesterday and I was trying to figure out like how I would describe you. So I used to work, I worked with this dude in Iraq and he, and he was a master chief EOD tech. And uh, he was, he was like this pretty iconic dude in the community and his name was Jerry Holmes, but he was universally known as Jerry motherfucking Holmes. <laughs> such, such to the point, his business cards had Jerry MF Holmes on it and it was in his signature block. And I was like, oh God, I, I feel that. like, I feel like that would be appropriate to talk to like, that would be Bobby's name, like Bobby motherfucking Millsaps. Like, I think that would be appropriate. <laughs> That's uh, that's pretty rad. That's um, I'll accept that. Nobody. I, well, the thing is, like everybody, I think everybody would be like, yeah, that is Bobby. Seems that's appropriate. Right. That seems appropriate. Yeah. Um. No, but uh, yeah, I'm super stoked to have Bobby on. So I'll give you guys a real brief snapshot. So Bobby, uh, kind of, 2006 roughly started CrossFit. So she's been 14 years almost at this point uh, in the community seminar staff. Um, has judged at the games numerous years, has been intimately involved in the administrative side for HQ and testing, um, things like that, but just has uh, been really, really entrenched in CrossFit since the beginning, like before it was CrossFit, um, an affiliate owner uh, for many, many years. So um, she has a lot of insight into a lot of different things with regard to CrossFit at the affiliate level, at the HQ level, all that stuff. And uh yeah, and I just genuinely enjoy talking to her. So this is gonna be fun. Um, but so we were ch we were just literally just chatting for about twenty minutes before we hit record. But um, so you live out in the country now, so like you super into horses and all that stuff. But like, what was your dance? Was your background? Yes. And then. So if anybody who's ever been to a seminar with, with Bobby, who's lovingly referred to as Bobby Joe in many, many instances, um, good mover. Like, and most answers are, oddly enough. Uh, yeah. I'm not, I'm not oddly enough, um, but super flexible, really good squats, stuff like that. What, how long did you dance for? Um, I started when I was five years old, and um, I finished right before I turned 20. Um, so 15, 15 years. 15 years. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. And then I always, I'm always curious as to what kind of dance. So um, I went to a pretty strict school, um, dance academy, where the the lady that ran it, she was a, uh, she's from England, and she went to the Royal Ballet School in England. And um, her name was Mrs. Freeman. And we were all required to start uh, with ballet only. It's pretty, you know pink tights, black leotard, hair in a bun, just not like you couldn't just show up even at five years old. So um, you had to be kind of groomed into being able to do other styles. So I started with ballet and tap and then moved into um, jazz, contemporary, classic jazz. Um, what so, is yeah. contemporary? Um, it's like, mo I don't know if you're familiar with modern dance. Is this, in, is this interpretive? Not, I mean, yes and is, no. Is, um, this, is this out of Will Ferrell when he's got the streamer from, from old school and he's like, so, <laughs> no, that, I don't, I don't know what that is. Uh, <laughs> that's comedy. Um, <laughs> so uh, I guess I should rephrase. So maybe not contemporary. Um, we started with modern dance. So Martha Graham and Alvin Ailey and that, that type of movement. Um, okay. It's a lot more athletic uh, than people might think, and it takes a lot more uh, strength and just ability to put your body into some some odd positions. But um, contemporary would be more kind of what they would call like lyrical dance, or you know, where you're just dancing, you're feeling. It's clearly dancing your feelings to a a song, like what Got you would it. see on that show, like so you think you can dance. What most of them are doing when they're dancing to like love songs or oh okay I got yeah it. and right. this is layman's terms but yes um, yeah I was yeah. thinking more like of that kind of like weird I don't want to say hippie that like we'll call it um, you know what's the word uh, but like strange where like they're dancing and you're like 
what are they doing right now? Like, yeah, I mean, cle- some- clearly there's a song in that person's head, but it's not what I'm listening to. <laughs> they're, they're just, they're <laughs> OFP. They're listening to their own song. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, we were pretty restricted to more like classical styles of dance. Um, so I didn't, it wasn't like hip hop or cheer or anything like that. It was very, um, it was very traditional. Um, we, and- we tried to take Logan to a ballet class, and um, <laughs> the second we tried to put tights and a leotard on her, um, that was that. That was the end of the ballet class. She was not having it. So not having it. I don't think. I don't think, you know, traditional dance is going to be in her future. But we'll see. That was kind of that was like my first exposure to to. Um, as I got older when you were in high school, a way to pay for your tuition. Cause if you're at a competitive level, things get really expensive and a way to pay for your tuition is to pay your dues by assisting with the, the little kids classes. So oh, like as an, like an assistant instructor kind of. Yeah. Got yeah. It. Which, you know, essentially when you first start is um, it's kind of a lot like interning on seminar staff. You're just, you know, <laughs> Just shut your mouth and do as you're told. <laughs> just running around and, you know, trying not to let anybody uh, mess things up, which with, with little kids, it is really fun to see little kids when they first start to find a beat in dance or um, start to kind of learn to memorize uh, steps. I think anything like that's good for kids. Any, any, any sport where you're required to memorize uh movement patterns and repeat them over and over. I think that's, it's great. Yeah. For kids. Yeah. Like Logan's definitely not there. Like she definitely falls in that interpretive dance category that I was describing earlier. <laughs> We're just like, <laughs> you do you kid. Um, She's uh, awesome, by so, the way. so then, so let's talk a little bit about like your int- your entrance. So 2006 is a different time that most people probably don't even can't even comprehend what CrossFit was back then. Yeah, like it is. De- it definitely no longer resembles that today. Uh, yeah, yes, and I mean, yes, the com- I guess the community. I guess uh, I should be more specific there. Like CrossFit yeah, yeah. in and of itself, the methodology, the delivery of all, like that hasn't really changed much at all. Right. Um, so. I was kind of just thrown into it. Um, my husband, Brandon, uh, his billet in the Marine Corps at the time um, had a lot to do with developing a new combat conditioning program for the Marine Corps. And um, they just started researching a lot of different forms of functional fitness. And uh, CrossFit was kind of referred to them through another subject matter expert that they use for um, I, the only way I know how to say it is like stalking, like human stalking and all that stuff they went through, oh, tracking yeah, yeah, yeah. and yep. whatever. And so one of the guys that they knew, um, Hunter Armstrong, he knew Dave Warner and Nick Nibbler of CrossFit North, who I think they might have been maybe like the fourth CrossFit affiliate or first CrossFit affiliate, something like that. Yeah, when your CrossFit affiliate is named after a cardinal direction, you're probably pretty hard, pretty high on the list as far as <laughs> affiliate numbers. Yeah. Yeah, so um, they went up to Seattle, CrossFit North, and it was Brandon and like one or two other dudes. And um, he called me and he said, this place is like a big playground for grownups. I was like, what do you mean? He was like, there are like cargo nets and there are these plates that you can drop and they bounce. (laughs) (laughs) There's hanging there's rings like it, it's crazy um he uh then he was trying to explain to me that he won a t-shirt for going sub 10 on a workout called helen and i didn't even know what that was, and this Shit. was that's pretty good back like, in the day yeah 2005 and they gave him a t-shirt and it was like a little cartoon it was like a little sketch of like a submarine and it just had the number like 10 um but then like two days later he was still out there and he called me and he was like, I am so sore. I cannot get out of bed. He was like, but I'll tell you right now, this shit is the real fucking deal. Um, (laughs) and he came home and he was like doing it at work during lunch breaks and whatever, but where they were, it was a training battalion. So they just trained a lot. And, um, coincidentally at another schoolhouse on uh, TBS, the base school in Quantico, um, 
were Brian Shantosh and Todd Widman. And uh, they somehow would get together with Brandon and a couple other dudes and they would just start trying. So to all three stuff. of them were there at the same time. Um, yeah. On, at the basic school. So Tosh and I did um, not know Todd, that. Yeah. Tosh and Todd were over at IOC. Uh, okay. Industry Auction course yep. they're instructors over there and then brandon um was our instructor at the mace the martial arts center of, uh, okay ICE. that's cool yeah they've both been on the podcast that's uh i didn't realize they were all there at the same time that's really cool yeah jimmy letchford was somewhere around there too i feel like he worked for the war fighting lab maybe on uh main side um quantico but um the pool i don't know if you've ever been to the basic school on yep. quantico mm -hmm. um yeah so you know it's like main side and the fbi academy and all yep. that stuff in the middle and then the basic school and uh, the pool is shared by all the schoolhouses and training entities on the basic school. And so they would take like barbells and plates and throw them in the pool. They would try to do like underwater Fran and all just all kinds of craziness. And um, sounds safe. <laughs> yeah. And then throughout their continued Brandon's continued kind of development and trying to come up with new ways to keep, you know, Marines fit for or combat and develop that program, um, coach invited him to a level one. Mm -hmm. And it was in San Diego back when there, they were like almost three days long and all the SMEs would come, Coach Bergener, um, they would have, uh, you know, someone come out and talk about rowing and- um, So talk about that so, a little bit, because I don't think, I, everybody yeah. sees the well-oiled machine that is the level one, level two these days. Two-day course, it's very much, you know, it's structured, uh, but very but very seamlessly run. But it used to basically resemble a conference, is probably the best way I would explain it. Like, it was just a, it was this conglomerate of people that would show up and talk about their thing. Yeah, I think from, the time between the time when Brandon went to his level one and the time that I went to mine, they had tried to maybe cut that down a little bit. Like we didn't have the big, we didn't have a, a bunch of um, SMEs at our course. Yeah. Um, Buddy Lee, Buddy Lee was at our course in 2006. But, oh, nice. um, yeah, back, back then it was, I, I think it was almost like a three day event and uh, you would get to work out like 10 SMEs. times. Yeah. You worked out a lot. Um, and uh, at that time, Brandon met um, Coach Bergener, Mike Bergener, who um, invited the Marines that were at the course back to his house to just lift in his garage. And um, somehow out of all that, uh, it came about that, hey, you guys should come to uh, our Olympic lifting course in San Diego in September. Um, so when Brandon started CrossFit, he was you know, he's like the foundation is with the lifts. He was just kind of drilling that into my head and mm -hmm. drilling the nine movements into mm -hmm. me. And so essentially for like six months, um, when he got his first exposure to CrossFit and then when I went to coach Bergener's, um, course in San Diego, I, I had never put my hands on a barbell. I only worked on the nine movements and then, uh, the clean and jerk and snatch with a PVC pipe filled with sand in our basement, um, in our townhouse in Quantico. Did you get fitter? I, yeah. 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 I, I got fitter. I wasn't really doing CrossFit with intensity because the dancer in me thought that everything needed to be perfect. So I was that analogy you guys give at the level yep. one, you give at the level one about every movement's perfect. And what, what do we want them to speed yeah. up or, or what? So, uh, so yeah, I, I went to the, I went to the Olympic lifting gig in September, 2006. And, um, that was the first time when I checked in for registration that I met Nicole, Nicole Carroll. Um, and I'd only ever seen her in the videos that yeah. Brandon and I would watch on CrossFit.com, you know, just like everybody else back then. We yeah. were, I would watch them at work. Um, we'd watch them on our dial up internet whenever, you know, <laughs> you had time. Um, and I was like, kind of starstruck, you know, checked in and, and because she had known Brandon and the community was still pretty small at that time, she gave, she just gave me the biggest hug. And I was like, wow, these people are, are really nice. And, and so at my Olympic lifting course back then, I mean, it was kind of like a, the all-star list, right? It was coach Bergener led it at Rancho Buena Vista high school, the high school where he used to be the, the coach, the strength conditioning guy. Um, 
his daughter Sage uh, was there running, you know, the demo for him. Uh, Amy and Aya was there. Greg Everett was there. Um, let's see. Who else? Oh, Dave Castro was there. And uh, and then participants that were going through the course were like uh, me, my husband, Brandon. Uh, Todd Woodman went through the OLIF course at the same time. EC went through the same OLIF course in San Diego. Um, okay. Yeah. And um, and I was I was just hooked. That was the first time I ever touched a barbell. And um, I was like, this is kind of my new ballet, you know? That's cool. Um, yeah. And I, it just fired me up too, because we weren't even really doing workouts. We were just lifting. And so anytime somebody would improve in their technique, you worked out on a platform with a group of like three people. Um, you just get so fired up for other people just to yeah. see them improve their movement. And uh, did you pick, did you pick up the lifts pretty quickly? Because generally dancers are, are quick studies because they have better awareness, body awareness than other people. Like, but they're not, you, they're not generally uh, great at like, once you give them a load, like they're just like, they're not the strongest, I guess is the way I would. Yeah. Say. That, and that is exactly, that's exactly the case with me. Um, when it was light loads or empty barbells, PVC. Um, yeah. I picked it up really, really quickly, but um, there was a disconnect in me having the ability to understand that I needed to, uh, oddly enough, open, extend my hip to, to generate that power. Because with dance, even though you're, you're extending your hip for a lot of the powerful movements, you're not even, you're not thinking about it. Everything's generated from like your core, um, legs and, and all that stuff. But we spend a, a lot of time in partial squat positions um, yeah. as dancers. And so, to rapidly just extend so that you can move an object. Uh, it didn't translate for me. So, uh, like dance, I mean, like, and it should, because it's a very fluid kind of, um, it, but it generally like lacks aggression. Oh yeah. I was very, I was very slow with the lift, slow yep. to um, pull underneath for the receiving position of snatch, slow to pull underneath cleans. Everything that I did was almost like a, it was always power cleans, power snatches. I had a hard time like driving underneath the bar in the uh, jerks um, because it, I did make it so fluid. It was very slow. It was almost yeah. just like a jump and press and lightly fall underneath. The you bar. were that person that had like, the real the soft feet to the ground. They're just like my feet, just like you can't hear their feet at all. They just kind of like very gently get to the ground, the feet. Yeah. Um, but then the overcorrection of that, that is having, um, mm -hmm. Because back then, I don't think most of us could see um, good movement versus bad movement, and uh, we could we could execute it to a certain degree, but we didn't really know how to correct it very well because it was still so new to us. And mm -hmm. at that time, the only you know brilliant people were the people that had really just worked under Greg um, yeah. at Santa Cruz, like you know Nicole and Annie and Michelle Moots and all those folks and, and then the SMEs. Right. And so when you have, uh, one of your peers who's kind of learning it as you're learning it, say like, Oh, just be more aggressive with your feet. That turns into just the good old donkey kick, foot stomp, <laughs> you know, maybe if I'm loud with these wooden shoes on this wooden floor, that is aggression. That sounds man. If I smash my feet on the ground harder, that will translate into lifting heavy weights. Oh yeah. And it never <laughs> happened. Never happened. Oh, uh, um, great. Yeah. So, um, from there, I guess Brandon was still working with coach on a lot of that stuff and coach invited me to come to a level one. And so I went to my level one in Boston in October, 2006. And okay. I, I had no idea. <clears throat> uh, what to expect. I had no idea what was going on. Brandon was like assisting kind of back then. Um, you're there attending. So you've done the, you've done yeah. the weightlifting and then now you're attending the level one. Yes. Okay. Yes. And Brandon was kind of assisting with running groups. Okay. Um, a lot. It was, it's a lot different than it is now, but um, yeah, I just, I had no idea what was going on and I hadn't really even done a like, a full CrossFit workout because a lot of what I did was just learning the movements. I don't really, I never had intensity or anything like that. And, yeah. Uh, coach did every lecture 
and a lot of it was pretty over my head. Um, I still have my notebook from my level one and I have words that are circled that were reminders for me to go look those up in a dictionary. <laughs> well, I mean, in all fairness, I still feel that way when I listen to him talk sometimes. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. Um, but it was a dose, man. Uh, but, but it was cool. Like you walked in and the community was still so small. I feel like I'd seen so many of these people just here and there and just meeting them through Brandon or meeting them through coach. And, uh, I walk into the course and, you know, obviously coach was there. Nicole was there. Dave was there. Um, Lynn Pitts, Kelly Moore, Greg Amundsen, um, Jesse Woody. There, there were just a lot. And then taking the course at the same time was uh, John Gilson and I did our level one. Okay. Together. Um, so there was not a ton of structure in terms of, well, it didn't seem to me like looking back on it, you know, how now we have the, you know, we have our lectures and our timelines and our schedules and material that needs to be presented. Um, it was a lot of Greg just being brilliant. Brain and, uh, just brain dumping on everybody. Yeah. And, and like, you couldn't get enough. Like I, he could have been reading the phone book and I would have been like, this is the <laughs> smartest thing I've ever heard in my life. Like I'm sold. Um, and I feel like really the one thing that really stuck out to me, um, in the lecture and I, at the time, I don't know if it was supposed to be the, what, it, what is fitness lecture or if it was him talking about it. I can't remember, but um, I just remember him really talking about um, the sickness, wellness, fitness continuum. And I was just dumbfounded and kind of like, that makes total sense when he explained how fitness is a hedge against sickness. Mm -hmm. Like you have to pass, you will pass through the parameters of like the biomarkers of normal before you get sick. And, uh, I was like, man, like being an athlete my whole life, um, and just being exposed, even after I stopped dancing, I went into the fitness world teaching yeah. like aerobics group fitness, but I always worked. I always, I always worked out. I always lifted, um, and did some form of fitness, but I just remember thinking like, wow, like this is why we train. It yep. had never occurred to me before that, right? Like everybody thinks you're training mostly for aesthetics or to lose body fat, but you don't really know why you want to lose body fat. You just know that you don't want to have body fat because it's not attractive or whatever. You don't want high blood pressure. I don't know why you don't want high blood pressure. I don't, at that time, I don't even think I knew what high blood pressure markers really were. Like I, I was pretty, ignorant to the sciencey part of everything well i think i think I'll, most people were uh, honestly yeah. like i i think back at that time and it, you know like I, my whole life i was an athlete but i it never occurred to me that you would train to be for, for your health right like it was always like yeah i have to be the best at the sport and then post athletics it was just to to essentially just not be fat Right, just like, maintain. You're like, I'm in, I'm in a maintenance phase now, basically. Yeah, which, but it wasn't ever, it wasn't ever, it never crossed my mind to continue to chase something else after it from a fitness standpoint, which is like, I, maybe I could be fitter than I was in college. You know, if, the way we think about fitness now. Um, yeah. Yeah, I don't think that was weird. I think that's kind of how everybody viewed it. Like, it wasn't a health, it, it was almost like, it was almost like you were just doing it to, kind of not be sick, but not necessarily to be healthy, if that makes sense. That's yeah, correct. And and I, I feel like it, it's also one of those things where there was never a correlation in my mind to working out, eating healthy and, and just like not getting heart disease. And I don't know why, I yeah. don't know why I never associated working out with, um, sickness in general, mm -hmm. you know, cause we, I mean, we just weren't taught that in school or whatever. Um, yeah. and, and when you're an athlete growing up, most of your stuff is like, Hey, I'm doing this to be better and to like win yeah. at whatever it is I'm competing in. Mm -hmm. Um, but like you said, when you're an adult and you're still training, you're just basically training to maintain. 
at whatever level you can. It was largely uh, aesthetic. I mean, if you think about the eighties and aerobics and, and just that come, that's probably when like jazz or size and probably like hit its peak. And, yeah. And, like it's, it was all based on physique. It was purely aesthetics. Yeah. As far as like, you want to look this way, but it, it was never driven as like, this is going to be beneficial to your health long term. It's just like, you don't want to be sloppy looking basically. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, when, when Brandon's whole mission with um, the Marine Corps and, and working with Greg, when all that came about, it was essentially questioning what good is it going to do a Marine or anybody in the military in, um, in a combat situation if they can run an 18 minute, three mile runtime, be able to do 20 strict pull-ups and however many crunches. And like each military branch has their own fitness test, but they're all, like, they're all very, they're the same flavor flavor with just a slight tweak. Yeah. And, and so I think that that's really why CrossFit was so big with the military so early on is because, you know, it generally, it genuinely was making people healthier and fitter to be able to stay alive um, yeah. in combat. I mean, Tosh has talked about that uh, on numerous occasions when he started doing that and like playing rugby with his, uh, with his, the guys in his platoon and his squads and stuff like that. And then it, it's, it's interesting that at, at the ground level, people understood it, like whatever that was almost 15 years ago. Yeah but it's still taking that long. So I was just in San Antonio at Lackland Air Force Base. So we did a level one at, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. at the Air Force Base there. And it's, it's really cool to see the higher ups, like the O6s, the people that have the ability to really make change there, ha have bought into this idea of, of long-term health and fitness. And they're trying to, so for anybody who doesn't know, Lackland is, is the, basic entry point for all airmen in the air force. They all go through basic training in Lackland air force. It's a really big base, but they are investing a lot of time and money into basically really bringing these brand new airmen and like giving them the tools for health and wellness on day one, because what they're looking at, which is the same thing we look at is can we reduce the, the long term cost that is the long tail of, of service members being sick and like, what do they yeah. need for insurance long term and like what are like disability payments and all of that stuff so they're really starting to look at that really really hard and and it was cool because like everybody there was super stoked and it was a 50 some odd person seminar and everybody there was like in it and it was great so yeah it's a uh, it's pretty awesome to look back we used to do a lot of uh, military courses and i think that's starting to come back um yeah. the air force is like we we we'll take these as frequently as we can make them happen. I think it's coming back, especially, you know, and I, I can't really speak to a ton of it. Um, Cause I don't know the ins and outs, but I know now that um, a lot of the stuff has come to light with the NSCA and mm -hmm. um, just the basic slander of our program that uh, just really shed us in a bad light for, for government organizations. I think now that that's kind of over and done. And I, I think we're going to start moving back into those, those spots. We, I remember doing a course in uh, at Fort Leavenworth, which I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, I feel like it's the Army War Fighting um, or something I'm like sure that. That's a, I think that's a joint base, but it's... It is a, yeah, it is joint, because there was a, a, I know there was a, a Marine who was kind of instrumental in bringing it there, but we did a couple there and I remember I've only like, worked there once. Yeah. It was like our second one. This was back in maybe like 2009, 2010. And there was a, a Colonel that went through the level one. And at the end of the workout on day one, he asked if it was okay if he, if he spoke to everybody and he just kind of stood up on a plyo box in the middle of this gymnasium and talked to all the soldiers uh, going through the level one and the staff and and he was really fired up he was like this is gonna save lives this is gonna make people fitter it's gonna make people happier and healthier like he it it was pretty awesome um and and, and that's kind of the feeling that i think most people get when they go to the level one it's certainly the feeling that uh that i had at mine even though um i remember doing fran 
at the end of day one. I, well, I remember at lunch asking Brandon, what workout are we going to do? And he said, Fran, and I started crying. <laughs> <laughs> I started crying and um, he was like, it's fine. You can scale it. Cause I cried because I said, I can't do pull-ups. <laughs> I, you know, yeah. and I'd been trying to get like one dead hang pull-up for months. Um, so much so that I ended up tearing, um, an ab like it like split straight up and down and it oh wow so it gave me like a little hernia i would just get on the pull-up bar and just strain and strain and strain <laughs> i didn't even know i tore anything you know and it was just my fault because i would just like try so hard so many times a day um just going into that level one because i knew that we were probably gonna have to do a pull-up so uh, we do Fran and I remember, um, at the time going through the course, um, also at my level one were, um, Jennifer and Mike Petrogallo who went on to open and still currently own operate CrossFit Pittsburgh. Okay. Two of just like my favorite people, but Jen was a lot like me, you know, we're kind of like our husbands were military. They're like, you're going to go to this CrossFit shit with me. Um, uh, we're going to do it. It's going to be awesome. And at that time, at the level one, you didn't necessarily have to like do the workout of the day. You didn't have to do Fran. Um, but for me, I had to Brandon. It was like a not yeah, You're doing it. You're not going to embarrass me. You're going to do this fucking workout. So you're, I you're not embarrass me in front of my friends. <laughs> yeah, basically. Um, and so I just remember getting set up with, I think it was the 55 pound bar. And I made Jen Petrogallo, I, I, to this day, like, she's still it's one of my happiest memories, even though it was terrible at the moment. I'm like, you're doing this workout with me. And I didn't know her at all. I just knew it was somebody <laughs> that was kind of like me and didn't want to do this workout. And I was like, you're doing it. And I remember having to scale the pull-up and it was jumping pull-ups. And I remember she and I side by side on this pull-up bar doing jumping pull-ups. And she goes, she looks over at me in the middle of the workout. She's like, why did you make me do this? <laughs> well, like, Cause I wasn't going to do it by myself. Yeah. God. I'm not going to do this nonsense by myself. You're yeah. With somebody and, else. And, yeah. And so, um, and then the next day it was just more of things being over my head, but my mind being blown and, you know, learning that, uh, learning about what the sport of fitness actually is, which I think. Yeah is I never thought like, Oh my God, I should actually try to be better every yeah. time I work out yeah. instead of trying to maintain, like we were talking about. Um, and we did fight gone bad and I'd never, I'd never touched a med ball. I'd never thrown one. Um, and I got three total wall ball points because my partner was a, just a bit of an asshole. Like, <laughs> Give it to me. You know what I mean? Clearly. Hey, effort, uh, effort. You see the effort over here? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it was a 10 foot target. I'm five, two. Um, I'd never done it. I on, got, a, on a good day. You're five, two, Bobby. <laughs> come on now. I, in three rounds, she counted only three total reps. And Probably the first one. <laughs> well, well, the, no, cause the first one I threw up and it came back down and hit me in the face. <laughs> and, uh, and then, and then realizing that you still had like all this time left and all these other exercises to do somewhere along the way, I think it was in the second or third round of box jumps, I uh, had to stop and run outside and throw up. Um, I was crying. Nicole was there and she was crying because I was crying. Um, cause she, I, Nicole, she has, she's great with her ability to just kind of empathize and yeah. She's very emotionally intelligent that way. And she also gets motivated seeing people yeah. do CrossFit, you know, yep. um, and celebrate that. I mean, if you, if you think back to watching Nasty Girls when she had a rough day, she she cried in that video a little bit. So maybe mm -hmm. that, yeah, she, yeah. she felt for me. She yeah. knows what it feels like to be short, doing wall balls and <laughs> getting smashed in the face, <laughs> doing box jumps, getting smashed in the face, you know, so uh yeah, from then on, I was sold. We we had um, we drove to that gig from Quantico, so we had a good like I don't know, maybe ten hours back. Oh wow! Home and um, I was so just just pumped. Um, That's awesome. 
yeah. And then I don't know what happened. We got invited to go to another level one in May of 2007 in Golden, Colorado. And um, they asked if I would like to assist and try to like help coach groups and get evaluated. Um, and I didn't really know what that meant at the time. Um, and so the first part of the course, uh, one of the people evaluating me was Pat Sherwood. And um, then the second part of the course and the one who gave me kind of my final eval was Mike Minium of uh, CrossFit Oakland. Okay. Um, but at that course, going through their level one, uh, it was, that was Spieler, Chris Spieler. Okay. Um, Dennis Marshall. Okay. Becky Harsh. Um, yeah. And it, it was at elevation. It was a humbling experience, you know, just in general to even just have to walk and talk at the same time. Yeah. Um, but that was a dose of a weekend in that I kind of just found my niche. I'm like, Hey, I might not be able to move a ton of weight and I know I'm not the best athlete here. Um, but damn, I really love coaching. And uh, I just got invited to do a, a private military gig at Weapons Training Battalion in Quantico that summer. And then from then on, the rest is history. I got to, they asked if I, Nicole emailed me and said, hey, I heard you did a great job. Do you want to come down to Jacksonville, Florida? And that was September 2007. And um, that's where I met Mike G and Jenny. and. Um, yeah, it was, it was awesome. And then cool. the rest is just kind of, for me, the rest is history. Yeah. yeah. How long after that did you guys start your affiliate? Um, so that was September when I came on staff, September, 2007. I was not in any kind of an affiliate situation until July of 2008. When okay. we moved to Columbia, South Carolina, Brandon was okay. an officer selection recruiter in Columbia. And one of the guys who had gone through a level one, um, we got to know him really well. And uh, he asked if I would like to come in and run his gym. And I had no experience running an affiliate, no experience really even coaching outside of the level one. Yeah. So I was kind of a reverse right? Um, I started on staff before Yeah, I was coaching an affiliate. And I don't think that was, that was pretty common at that time, honestly. Like a lot of people weren't opening affiliates so far back in the day. Um, yeah, it's definitely not like today where, you know, it's just, it's happens every day basically. Right. And so I, I worked at Carolina CrossFit and helped Brandon and I took over. I remember we took over programming for the affiliate in January of 2009. And um, we opened our affiliate in Northeast Columbia, South Carolina um, in June, 2010. So okay. yeah. So at the time I was working on seminar staff and working at this affiliate downtown and um, we would always just kind of, we always had a garage gym set up, even though we, we had an affiliate to go work out at, but it was about 20, 25 minutes away. Yeah. And, and so even those folks, or even the owner of that gym, we would have people over to our house and we would do workouts, drink beer, hang out, um, and then work with CrossFit HQ picked up enough to a degree that I was... Um, working with testing. I started doing the testing stuff um, and, and accreditation stuff in 2009 and still working gigs. And I just didn't have the time to um, be able to make it into the downtown Columbia area to work yeah. at that gym. And so as an outlet, because I just couldn't let it go, just start coaching people out of our garage. And um, it just got big enough that we were like, should we move into a space? And then we decided no. And then Brandon was just driving home from work one afternoon and he pulled into this industrial complex and uh, he went to open the door to one of these, um, you know, one of the little complex areas and it was unlocked, but it had been abandoned. So 
we went on to find out that people had skipped out and Brandon contacted the, the landlord, the people that managed it and owned that facility. And they gave us a really great rate on it. And the next thing you know, I guess we have like an official affiliate location. We're not in our garage anymore. Um, so this is where I have so many questions because yeah. So you guys opened June 2010. I think, yeah. I think the, I don't remember the exact time frame, but it was like, we opened ours like around November or October of 2009. Um, and the list of shit that I've done poorly is far longer than the list of things I've done right. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Um, but I always like to ask people, I'm like, what are some of the things, like if you could, if you could go back in time, what would you do differently? Um, I will start, let me start with like what I think we did pretty okay. Okay. Uh, we didn't go in all out. Um, meaning like, meaning when we had our garage gym, we, we had two of like, we just made it a point to have two of everything, you know, one female. Got it. You didn't drop 20 G's on equipment. Right. And so when we moved into the space, we basically just upped that to where we had five of everything. Yep. Um, and we programmed so that we could have our classes in a way that we were able to stagger heats or run more than one heat. Mm -hmm. um, because also at that time, there wasn't like, Rogue wasn't huge. I mean, this is 2010. Um, you couldn't get equipment back then. Like, no, uh, people, no. People don't understand that, but like, it wasn't like, the Rogue was not even a thing then. Like, I don't think they really, like, I mean, in 2000 and, 2009, yeah. maybe, I remember like, being in some field in Ohio and like Bill and Katie, like running around, like just like they were just hauling equipment around. Like I remember. Yeah. yeah. So we got, we were in being in Columbia, South Carolina, we were just about an hour South of Charlotte, North Carolina. So we would go up there because muscle driver was up there mm -hmm. and you so you could get stuff from muscle driver and we could go up there and pick it up instead of having to have it shipped. Um, or you could just walk through their warehouse and look at their scratch and dent material and by scratch and dent. I mean, there's barely, there's nothing even wrong with most yeah. of this stuff. Um, and then we had to order custom racks. We had one rack. Um, so kind of like, you know, a lot of what Rogue does for garage gyms now where it's, um, yep. you know, the pull up bar rig yep. with just, you know, for one barbell. And, uh, we custom ordered about five of those. So, okay. well, four. So we had one going into it and then we ordered four more. Um, I remember on our opening, our grand opening day, we did Fight Gone Bad, but we only had one rower. So we did Fight Gone Bad with burpees instead of rowers. And then Ooh. I would say rowers were the most expensive piece of gear as a new affiliate owner to be able to have enough of something to be able to run workouts with. I mean, that's probably the one still are, to be honest with you. Yeah. That's the one thing that we just would kind of, as finances allowed, we would always just go and buy, it was always a rower, uh, barbells and bumper plates. Yeah. Um, but we, everything was very, very slow and methodical. And, uh, we never, Brandon and I didn't open an affiliate to make money. Um, we both had jobs. He was an active duty Marine at the time. He was a, he was a gunny. He was an E7. And, um, you know, I was working full time. I was working pretty much full time for CrossFit with testing and, and mm -hmm. helping Nicole with accreditation stuff. And then I was still working a decent amount of gigs, sometimes three a month. Um, so on that note, cause this is always an interesting kind of discussion because uh, there's a lot of people that that opened affiliates at that time without with no real intention of making it a viable business they could live off of do you think that was a pro or a con for you guys um so that leads into my cons um okay. we love to coach so much that it just it just seemed like the next step for us to just be able to have our own place and do our own programming and, and just coach and have a good time. Um, but the, mis the major mistake that we made in that we didn't need the money. We basically just needed to make rent, which is pretty easy to do. Yeah. And we owned everything outright in cash. Um, 
So we never, I didn't, we didn't go into debt to buy equipment. Yeah. Um, I, we undervalued our time. And so, whereas at the time, most CrossFit gyms, I mean, on the West coast, it was just a, a totally different yeah. price point than it was on the East coast, but also in, in the South in Columbia, South Carolina, um, where it's hard to get people to understand that, Hey, there's this new, you know, functional fitness is where it's at. Like you can pay $30 a month and go to gold's gym and swipe a membership card. And they, they honestly won't know if you're dead because yeah. you're, you're, you're getting auto drafted every month. Mm -hmm. Um, we, we were hesitant to charge what we felt we were worth. Um, and we went like the exact opposite to a point to where we charged, I think it was 75 bucks a month for, for our membership. We had no contracts. We checked everything with, um, I think we just did everything through PayPal. Um, yeah. and your, your gym will grow, but our goal also wasn't to like grow. We didn't want to be huge. So it's like, yeah. well, we probably should have priced higher. Um, if we valued our time in that more people is, you know, more responsibility and mm -hmm. we both still had full-time jobs. We were never open during the middle of the day. We would do like the 6am, 7am, and yep. then I think like a 930 and then we would open back up at four or four 30 and then go until about seven 30, eight 30 at night. But we were always closed in the middle of the day because Brandon worked downtown. I worked in the middle of the day. Yeah. Um, and Charging 75 bucks a month was great. I think it, it was helpful in that it got the message to more people. Yeah. Uh, um, but at a certain point, you almost start to resent the fact that you have to go in and coach. Um, I wish more people, I'm, I wish more people would talk about that openly. Like that's a real yeah, thing. It is a real thing. Um, when, when you don't value your time in a way, and I, I say you don't value your time because you, you really don't like it. If you have a certain skill set and you're great at what you do, um, your time is valuable when you're coaching other people because it's not just about how, how, how well you coach. It's about how much you give a shit. And we really gave a shit because we really love to train people. Yeah. And so we weren't just invested in coaching them. We were in, we, genuinely loved these human beings. Like if I didn't see them, I would text them, call them like, Hey, where have you been? Give them shit. When we did see them the next time we were constantly doing like, um, you know, I think it was uh, Thursday nights. We do thirsty Thursday. So after the last class of the night, we'd go out to dinner with whoever wanted to go out, have some drinks, you know, we would do in, in, in March, we'd always do like March magnet madness basketball tournament. We'd go take everybody, go golf, kid play golf. Didn't matter. We just go out and have fun. Just a lot of events because our community was so tight knit at the time. Yep. Um, and we genuinely loved them. But at the same time, when you are only charging a certain amount of cash, you know, you're not taking a paycheck, everything that you make, you're putting back into the facility so you can buy yep. more gear because you have more people because now that means you're doing something good. Yeah. But when you start so low, it's very difficult from then on to increase your prices yeah. and members talk. Right. And so if you have your, your core group of like 30 people that have been with you since the beginning and they've been paying 75 bucks a month, it's really hard to then say, okay, well now our rate is like 125. And then that new person wants to know why this person only has to pay. Well, can I please just get that? Cause my kids start school and yeah. we have this sport coming up. And then you find yourself trying to come up with these creative ways to figure out a way that you can only charge them 75. Well, if you only come three times a week, I'll let you have it for 75. And yeah. then it's just a giant shit show of trying to manage a business, which I, had no interest in doing. Yeah. Um, and neither did Brian. And at, at the end of the day, we were just coaches who were really shitty business people. Um, <laughs> and I hated having the money talk with anybody. So I'd always make Brandon do it. And I just, I just, I get uncomfortable with all that. And, yeah. and it, how long, how long roughly before you kind of got 
I don't want to say salty, but before you started to get a little salty about it, before you're like, I don't really love this anymore. Like I don't want to teach class. Um, I would say in towards the end of 2011, and I'll tell you why. It uh, well, that's pretty fast. Well, here's it. Our situation was rather unique. Um, but one at the time we were doing more gigs, right? So, yeah. cr so CrossFit seminars were up, um, which was great because that means you're working more seminars, mm -hmm. but you, you understand that that's all, also emotionally taxing and, <sighs> and really taxing. It's exhausting. And because you, you're on such a high and you're meeting so many people and you're staying in touch with so many people, um, and you have such a great time meeting all these new participants who are just getting their first exposure to this stuff. So they're pumped. They actually want to be there. And then you go back to your classes and you have some people that it's like pulling teeth just to get them to like smile or, or put yeah. out during the workout. Um, but in June, July of 2011, um, Brandon's, Brandon's time was up in Columbia. Um, and oh, okay, got he it. Had to P he had to PCS to um, Camp Lejeune. Yeah, got it. North Carolina, which was four hours away. Um, and so the downside of that was then it was all on myself and then just one other trainer that we had groomed. Um, and all of our trainers were groomed from within. There's, n there's never a chance where. Which, which trainer was that? Um, her name's Jen Matthews. Oh, okay. I was going to, I thought it was, um, God, he was on Chris the Spigner. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. No, uh, Spigner was gone. Chris Spigner was gone to, uh, he was already living in open. He was living the life in the Canyon yeah. from uh, seven mile at that time. But, uh, yeah. So Jen, she walked into our, our doors on the day we opened and she was with us ever since she's a middle school teacher, just a, one of the, best humans I've ever met in my life. She mm -hmm. beautiful, intelligent, just such a kind hearted, genuine person. And she, because she teaches middle school, she's great at dealing with varying degrees of personalities yeah. um, and managing tough situations yeah. and handling tough situations. And so she, for us was the one coach that we just, we knew that she would be somebody that would, that would coach for us. And she did, she started coaching for yeah. us. And so, um, at that point we had a couple that we would look to, um, Zach Taylor was another one. He started out with us at Carolina CrossFit. He was awesome. Um, we just leaned, I leaned on a lot of these coaches at that time, but I could only, I felt like I could only do so much And to, it was at a point to where I wasn't even present when I was there coaching. Yeah. Um, I was, I was, I was, I was I, yeah, I would see Brandon like maybe once a month if I was lucky, but then when he would come home, he would coach, but it got to a point to where people didn't even know who Brandon was. And I didn't want, yeah, I didn't even want to be there anymore because it was something that we started together. Yeah. It's, um, I always tell people like passion is great. And if you can have the opportunity to like do your passion for a living, like then congratulations. However, passion that, is done for free labor has a shelf life. Oh yeah. And it's different for everybody, but I would tell you for most people, the maximum shelf life to do something for free that you're passionate about, um, it, it is about five years. And then at that point, now you're salty and then it's no longer a passion. It's something that actually like really makes you miserable. Um, and I think about it all the time. Like we should have raised prices earlier um, and for anybody, for any affiliate owner that's going through this, like, this is something I realized, like, if you need to raise your prices, just do it tomorrow for the next person that comes in. They don't know any better. Yeah. Like just, Hey, what's the price? You're like, it's uh, let's just say you're at 150 right now and be like, tomorrow it's 160. Next person that walks in, it's one, they literally don't know. Um, but cause you have to make that. And then you need to create a plan with which to bring everybody along and, you also need to understand that like not everybody's coming along on that journey with you. Like it's yeah. just, you're not going to bring all, all of them with you and that's okay. It's not, it's not this, it's not this ordeal that you think it is it's just like, Hey, we got to move forward. We can't just stay in the past. And 
I got to pay a mortgage too and all those other things. And if people will, people will make their decision. You just have to move along and, and try to work with people the best you can. But it is one of those things that nobody likes to talk about. It's just like, right. you know, I got to raise my prices. I'm like, cool. Like the other tips that I learned is like, do it, just do it to, and then figure out a way to backfill everybody that's there currently, but you eventually have to bring them all up or just do it on January 1st. Like nobody's shocked when prices change on January 1st. Well, and so we, we went through that. Um, you know, things just got increasingly more difficult because uh, while Brandon was stationed in North Carolina, I was still living. So I lived in South Carolina by myself for three years. Um, and so schedules don't match up in terms of he would come home and I'd be at a gig. Um, yeah. But in the middle of the week, I'm working a full-time job for CrossFit, sometimes traveling on the weekends, and I'm trying to manage this affiliate that we were doing together. Um, and I would say that that was, that was another huge mistake that we made. And we made it from like day one, um, when he was still living in the same, uh, state and we were running it together every day was that we were just too transparent with people and people were, we more about our business, um, and we just treated everybody like they were our family or our friends. What do you Early, mean? Like what? Like uh, in what sense too transparent? In a sense of we didn't just make decisions and in an authoritative way. Oh, you got everybody's opinion. <laughs> yeah, sometimes opinion. Which is or, shocking because I've known you for or, a long time. And that's or feeling the need to like over explain the reasoning behind oh got it why okay so we're gonna make this price increase and we we would have and almost like apologize yeah um because again you have two coaches running a business that really never wanted that kind to. of shocked me because that's not really your personality is the like i know i know <laughs> oddly enough it, i am i'm uh I, I am tough when i'm coaching but when it comes to the human side I am I am extremely sensitive I, I am well I mean I know that because I've known you for yeah. a long time but yeah, yeah. Um, oh yeah I, I get it and I have a hard I mean, like there's very few people that I think that are strong situation. in that arena I think there's very few people that are strong in that that there's a book called crucial conversations but they're that are that are really good in in tough scenarios like that like that's, a, that's definitely a skill set is developed through reps I don't even think people are naturally good at it I think that is reps it is and I and I you know in the past when I when I was helping out with running Carolina CrossFit I didn't have to really make those business decisions I didn't I didn't talk to yeah. people about money or paying um, I just coached and programmed and you know my whole world now with CrossFit is numbers and statistics and things like yeah. that. It's not that I'm not good at it. It's just when there's a human side to it, I, I really struggled um, with that. And, yeah. and I also, well, it's, I because, feel like, it's because you care. Yeah. It's just kind I, of the case. That's what it is. I, ju I just really wanted to please everyone. Yeah. Um, so if you were to go back, what would you do differently? Do you think, because somebody's listening to this and I'm like, damn, I'm in the same spot. Or somebody who's about to start an affiliate who's justifying that really low cost because they want to bring everybody in. What would you do differently? And do you think you could avoid it if you did it a, if you did it a second time? Um, first of all, I would tell anybody to make sure that you just start small. It, go back and read those journal articles about how to start in your garage or start in a space where it's going to be affordable to you and you don't have a ton of overhead um, and remove that pressure from yourself. Mm -hmm. And when you do decide to pull a trigger on like opening an affiliate, look at your demographic and look at kind of the average price for similar training in your area. And I'm not just talking about like CrossFit gyms. Look at what some of these private coaches are charging to train kids um, for sports specific training in that area. Um, some people I, would throw up in their mouth if they saw some of those prices. That it's true, but honestly, okay, some people can justify paying X, Y, Z for even personal training or, or sports specific training or private tennis lessons or whatever. Look at all that stuff 
and, and then look at your look at your relative level of experience and like okay how competitive um uh as a trainer and you know do i have the do i have that background and that knowledge to be able to back it up mm -hmm. and and set your price based on okay this is the amount of time i'm planning to invest in this facility this is how much i need for operating expenses be willing to take a hit going into it um and then set your price so that it's not so low just to get people to come in the door or not so low that you're only doing it because you just really love coaching people um yeah that never it going into it think about I, I would just say like coach classes somewhere try to do like coach like five classes a day for five five days a week for a couple weeks and see how exhausted you feel and then think to yourself <laughs> Would I want to coach this person if I knew they were only paying me X amount of dollars a month to be here? Or would I do this for 15 K a year? <laughs> right. Right. Because that, and you know, as an affiliate owner, I know affiliate owners who still really don't take any profit from their gym because they're paying coaches to fill the class, to help pick up these classes that are continually growing and growing and growing which which is not necessarily a bad thing where i no. get a little bit where i get a little bit stressed out is when there's people that are doing something like that who are trading memberships for coaches mm -hmm. so nobody's really getting paid and yeah. if, if, if you were paying coaches worst case scenario that means that there's built-in revenue there that you could take back if you absolutely had to so let's just say yeah. payroll payroll is like whatever let's say it's six grand a month well if you had to pick up all those classes at least you could pay yourself six grand a month. Like you'd be tired as shit, but you get six grand a month, you know? Right. Um, and that's something that I think people should really understand. And uh, I did a podcast with John Briggs, who's an accountant who runs profit first uh, methodology for micro gyms. But he said, it and he was like, listen, he was like CrossFit affiliates and CrossFit coaches have something amazing to give the world. Like you have to keep yourself not just above water, but you have to create an environment in which you thrive so that you can continue to provide that service to people for 10, 15, 20 years. And that's something that CrossFit, like because the, the, because the community is like so benevolent in just by nature that people will just throw themselves on their own swords because they're like, but I love CrossFit. I'm like, I get it, but I don't know that you should like die on that hill. Like you don't have yeah. to. Yeah. And I, I think the, they are, you know, hindsight's 2020, right? I think we started an affiliate at a time when there weren't a ton of other affiliate owners to, who have made this, these mistakes. Right. And so, um, I mean, even on staff, we didn't have a ton of folks that owned affiliates that were in these positions. Right. And, yep. and, I think that the community is in a much better place now because you can always speak to other people and kind of brainstorm and come up with ways and like what your, pod, your podcast, yeah. your podcast. Somebody's made the mistake idea. already. So it's to some, to some degree, there are certain mistakes I think within the, within the community that are, I don't want to say inexcusable, but really tough to justify at this point because I'll, like, I'll there's been say, established practices that'd be like you should not do that you know the, the downfall for us was that we put we put the business and members and trainers um before just before our growth as as human beings and before our marriage and before our health yeah um, our mental health and our physical health and um, it always took priority to a point to where, I mean, I mean, I decided to live away from my husband for three years so we could hold on to this gym, um, only to go on and sell it in 2014 because I just, we could, it wasn't sustainable. Um, when, when I, even as a trainer, you don't have to be an affiliate owner. If you, in any job that you do, mm -hmm. if you walk through the door, even before you're walking through the door, you're just crapped out that you even have to be there it's not it's, it's not going to be healthy. the best hour of their day no it's not it is definitely not so um we got lucky though we were able to to pass it on to start the gym it was sport of fitness crossfit and um, because that's trademarked 
um, Greg and Kathy and the folks over at the affiliates, they allowed us to keep that name even after it was trademarked. Um, but once we sold the affiliate, it could no longer, it, yeah. yeah, we had to change it. So it's now CrossFit Valor and um, we sold it to uh, Nate Hoyland who was deployed with Brandon and um, he was all things CrossFit. He's young and um, yeah. he's just all about CrossFit and he's a great athlete and had the potential to be a really good coach. I don't think it was in his wheelhouse to start, but um, he was going to get out. He was a corpsman and he got out of the Navy. Okay. And, um, he didn't buy it from us in 2014 immediately. We just moved him into our home in South Carolina. So that's another hit we took. We kept, an, we kept our home for a year and a half after I left and part of his salary was just living rent free in our home to God. run our business in our absence. Cause we weren't ready to let it go. Yeah. Um, and I think we sold it in 2017. Um, we made, we made the, we went through the process to sell it to him. Um, was that a relief? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was. And I, if we lived in the same area, it would not have been as difficult. But when you have when you have an obligation, especially a business obligation in another state, that's tough. It's a nightmare because even it's only three and a half hours away, but it's just taxes and it's far licenses. Enough, it's far enough and, away to present significant problems if something comes up. Yeah, yeah. Um, but we lucked out because um, we introduced. Jen, um, my favorite human as a trainer, we introduced her to Nate and a relationship ensued and um, they're now engaged. So we'll be getting married in March and um, he bought the gym and she and Nate run it together. They've started um, a side project where they are doing kind of nutrition coaching and, cool. and macro. I mean, that's a whole other, I think, side business they've been able to, to do as it's, and it's been really successful. Um, he started like a little media company, he does a lot of drone stuff and it's pretty epic. Um, we don't really have a ton of contact with them anymore, but yeah. I do still follow, follow. I don't follow the gym. I just, I can't bring myself to do it, but we still have relationships. I was going to say, that's probably a good thing. Yeah. Probably yeah. Good. yeah. Yeah. Definitely. We have relationships with some of the members, but I, I'm really proud of what we did while we were there, like the impact that we had. And I'm really proud of the two people who own it now. Yeah. Um, they're just great people. They're really humble. And uh, I, they're a great team. And I think honestly, Nate and Jen have done more with that affiliate than Brandon and I could have ever had the capacity to do. Yeah, and that's, Nate, I Nate is a smart business guy. Yeah. Jen is the caring teacher coach. I'm not saying Nate's a great coach, but I think that you it was exactly what Brandon and I should have been to run a successful affiliate. But on one side, you had just two people who really like to train and we really love CrossFit and we love yeah. coaching. Whereas with Jen and Nate, you get somebody who's a great business owner and really good at making tough decisions and somebody who's really empathetic, caring, sweet, and is a great good coach. Balance. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's balance. a great balance. So I'm really excited for them. It seems that's like cool. Doing really well, and that's uh, uh that's really awesome that that you got to hand that off, and that it's gonna you know, you hand it to somebody who's gonna you know, you know, like you said, like do it better, so you get to see it thrive and uh, and feel proud about that. I think that's really cool. Um, I just think that that like passing things on is just a huge. I don't know. I feel like it's something that's always just been ingrained in us in the CrossFit community. And especially very early on when I came into all this is that everybody was so welcoming. Um, coach almost insisted that I was able to be involved because Brandon was involved and um, just with, you know, Dave and Nicole and, um, just all the things they've done to just kind of pay everything that Greg did for them for to us. Um, and the same with the affiliate team. Uh, yeah. And I, I just think that like to be successful, 
in this community to be successful as a trainer or an affiliate owner or somebody working for this company, you really have to have like a genuine heart for service. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, you really have to not just surface say that you want to see people do well. You have to, you have to be willing to take a major hit emotionally and physically and spiritually to help other people be better than you were. Um, and that, that it was a huge growth process for me, even as an athlete, like it was very, I found it very difficult because I was just kind of coming into my own as an athlete. And here I am working out against people that I should want to be better than me. Yeah. But finding that issue with like, I feel like they're cheating and I don't like that their times better than <laughs> mine on the whiteboard. Cause I know it's bullshit, but yeah. as, as their coach, I had to find that balance. And I, I, I'm not saying like I threw some fits, you know, I was childish and, and, you know, behaved in a way that a coach shouldn't behave when somebody would beat me in a workout, you know, in the first few years of doing this whole thing. But at the same time, you know, I, I just, I had a big turning point when, um, Joe Alexander, who's a mutual friend of ours and yep. now kind of like your boss on seminar staff. No, he, um, he's not kind of my boss. He is my boss. <laughs> Joe, Joe is basically the reason that I am in a good, healthy place right now. And I, somewhere along the way, I just remember him telling me that, um, don't ever forget that leadership is service. Leadership is servitude. And it should be your goal to make everybody in the room with you at whatever time, wherever you are, to be better than you. Like, that's service. And I remember him saying that, and I never forgot it. Um, and I watched him live that, and I've watched so many people that came before us live it. And I, I have my shortcomings. Um, just as a human being in general, but that, that, that goes so far as to even just like when you're in a grocery store, being nice to somebody, being kind to the person behind the register and yeah, not making, I'm not making them a better person, but at least I'm leading by example and saying like, Hey, thanks so much. Or have a good day or just yep. treating them like a human. Um, got to care. Yeah. You got to care. And, and there's no, there's no substitute, for, substitute for that. So I, I think if, it, that just never goes away. Right. When coach would say, people would ask like, how do I become a great trainer? It's like, you just have to care. You just have to give a shit about other people. Um, but you have to be willing to bear the emotional burden that comes along with that. Yeah. Especially as a business owner. Yeah. Um, so. No, I think that's a, that's a really good uh, encapsulation of the whole thing, which is, and I think that's a really good, spot to end it because i don't really have anything to add to that so oh I, I think that's good um so take notes everybody um yeah we could do this all day but we're well over an hour at this point so um cool thank you ma'am i really appreciate it it's been fun yeah it's been fun i miss you fern i miss i know the, we gotta get I'm, to I'm, I'm, i miss the team hit me up next time you're in wilmington yeah I'll, we I'll will that point. was that was my fault on the last one but um Cool. Uh, we'll have you on again because there's some other stuff that I wanted to get to that we didn't get to, but that's okay because um, we're going to do, I don't know, maybe a thousand more of these podcasts. So we'll have you on. Well, I appreciate it, man. You're, you're awesome. I think what you guys are doing is really, really good. I wish that we'd had something like this um, 10 years ago. It, it would have been helpful to hear people. I just living in this world of, you know, social media where it's yeah. like, everybody, everything that gets posted, if you look at it, everybody's, their lives are just fucking awesome. Their business is awesome. Their workouts are awesome. <laughs> I'm just fucking awesome. Like it would have been really cool just to hear real people. people keep it that real. You know, just keep it, just fuck, keep it real. Keep it real. That's what we're trying to do. We will keep, keep trying real. to do that. So yeah, man. Um, awesome. If you guys have questions for Bobby about anything, uh, hit us up. We'll pass it along. Uh, but I will talk to you very soon and hopefully I'll catch up with you very soon. All right, Fern. Thanks so right. much. Yep. See ya. Thanks for listening to best hour of their day 
If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. First of all, it's free. How cool is that? There's a creation tool that allows you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer, so it becomes super simple. Some of these episodes with Fern or Todd or myself chatting with one another, we've done right within the app itself. Anchor will make it easy to distribute your podcast to all platforms, Spotify, Apple, and many more. And you can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make an awesome podcast in one place. All you have to do is download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started today. Come on, who doesn't have Spotify at this point? And if you were unaware, Spotify now is offering podcasts. That's right, on Spotify, you can listen to all your favorite artists, but also podcasts in one place for free. Spotify has a huge catalog of podcasts on every topic, including the one you're listening to right now, best hour of their day. On Spotify, you can follow your favorite podcasts so you never miss an episode. Premium users can even download episodes to listen to offline wherever you are, something I always do before I hop on a plane. And you can even easily share what you're listening to with your friends on Instagram and other social media platforms. Here's the deal. If you haven't done so already, be sure to download the Spotify app, search for best hour of their day on Spotify, or browse some other podcasts if you want. You can find them in your library tab. And also make sure to follow me so you never miss an episode of Best Hour of Their Day. Thanks again for listening to Best Hour of Their Day. Just a reminder, Fern and I have an amazing new show called Dropping In, premiering on our YouTube channel in early 2020. Be sure to head over to the Best Hour of Their Day YouTube channel now. Subscribe so you don't miss any of the episodes you've probably Heard us talking about it, summarizing some of our trip. You can see some highlights up on our Instagram as well, at best hour of their day. But I promise you, you're not going to want to miss out. So subscribe now. Thanks for everything you do. Thanks for letting us be a part of your lives. Hope you have a great rest of your day. Tune in tomorrow for another episode of Best Hour of Their Day.